Kev Kev. Nice to see you. Tim Tim. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you may have surmised, every opportunity to use surmise I will take. This is another episode of the Tim Ferriss Show, and it is also another episode of The Random Show with my first ever podcast guest and my perpetual friend, bestie numero uno, Kevin Rose. Worst show ever, but we did it. <laughs> you got to start with the rough draft. You got to start with the rough draft. <laughs> you, like, you, you had on this list of questions. You asked me what my favorite cereal was or some shit like that. I was like, Tim, you yeah. should not ask your guest that. Yeah, you were like, oh, it's one of those shows. And then I was like, oh, my God, I thought this was going to be a layup with kid gloves. But Kevin's busting my balls in episode one. But it was good. It, was it worked out. We got, we, we got a little hammed in that one, but it was fun. Got a little hammed. Speaking of ham, what do you have over there? We're, we're having a drink. Yeah, Sharing we're a virtual a cheers. Yeah, cheers to you. Let this be known to the audience and to the world that this was the first time I didn't want to drink, and Tim pressured me into drinking. Normally, it's the other way around. <laughs> I pressure you. I mean, you all said, right, just to just to replay the tape here. Yeah, I said, okay. "Do you have a drink?" And you're like, "No." And I was like, "But I have a drink." You're the one who's always busting my balls about having right. a drink. It's okay, dude. It's Friday, right? Well, you said it's three p.m., and I said, "But it's a Friday." And you're like, "You don't really need to say Friday. You can just say drinks." And then you walked off and got a drink. So. <laughs> I wouldn't say. I'm not sure if pressure. I mean, unless yeah, you, it wasn't really twisting an arm, was it? It was more just like a slight change of wind direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on my way. It, it was like a fingertip to the lips kind of pressure. Yeah, exactly. More. Like, Shh, say no more. Say no more. Sleep. Go get a beverage. So we have a lot to talk about. It seems like you got a big list. I have a big list. Yeah. Isn't what are you always about the way? case? We didn't talk about that. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about it. Well, what do you have? I just have some shitty champagne. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nothing worth mentioning. This is, I'm going to have to pronounce this because I don't speak French. Much like you might say, Versailles, Kentucky. There is a Versailles, Kentucky. This is French. I don't speak French, but you got this. It's a Bendol, B A N D O L, Appellation Bandol Contrôlé 2021. Then there's Domaine Tampier at the top. <laughs> and then this. <laughs> Love that Domaine Tampier. Domaine Tampier. It was. Recommended to me, actually bought for me by a friend. I'll call him Jay, not to dox him. He's not Jay-Z, but a good friend of mine. And it's fantastic. It's really nice. I put some ice in it just to be a heathen and to hearken back to the days of old when I was in Argentina, where they drink a lot of wine with ice, and I got into it. And uh, cheers, Kevin. Nice well, cheers. to see you. You know, actually, I've been doing ice in, in my wine as well. Daria's been giving me shit about it, my wife. And I said, you know what? It's hydrating at the same time. Get a little extra water in there. And, and that was my rationale. That yeah. said, I don't know if you looked up the price of that bottle, but you might be doing it a severe disservice by adding cubes to it. I don't know if it's an inexpensive bottle or because sometimes that can be a big faux pas. Yeah, you know, I'm okay. With, my Watch whole it's life like a $400 a- bottle. <laughs> You're just putting big cubes of ice. My whole life is just a series of faux pas. My fault. My uh, what would that be? Fawkes Pows? Fawkes Pows. It's, tw- uh, well, you know, okay, this is very unclear. It says price $25.47 to $672. So it's somewhere in that range. I don't know. It looks like $55. Okay. But I do think it may be somewhat challenging to get, but it's not an over the top. At the end of the day, if you're enjoying it with some ice, like Godspeed, right? You know, yeah, we could go on a whole Speaking wine of tangent. Godspeed. Let's speak of Godspeed. Can I start with my first thing to talk about? Oh, I can't wait to see this segue. Yes, please. Okay, so we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> One of the things that I would say we are known for at the Random Show is just random shit. And it's just like, okay, <laughs> we don't see each other for three, four months. What have we stumbled into that's stupid, that's fun, that's creative, that's whatever, fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. And it's all kinds of stuff. One of the things that you're quite good at, Tim, that I really enjoy as part of the random show that we do is you're always talking about how can I get the most value and satisfaction out of something that is low dollar value, meaning like, mm-hmm. is that totally. how you typically phrase it? Yeah. Or? yeah, like affordable luxuries. Like how can you- Affordable luxuries. Something like that, right? That sounds right. So there is a, the most, I would argue outside of like a standard Rolex day date the most popular watch in the world 
for watch nerds, I'd say probably recognizable watch would be the Speedmaster, mm-hmm. which is the watch that was worn to the moon. Mm-hmm. And it's an Omega Speedmaster. The original caliber that went to the moon, I think it was a 321. Uh, it gets really geeky. Like the, the very first Speedmaster that you can buy, like the first very release is you know, now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for a representation of a Speedmaster. Modern day Speedmasters from Omega, you can still buy them. They are, you know, let's call it, I, I have to check the price, but let's call it three and a half, four thousand dollars somewhere around there, maybe a touch mm-hmm. more. I haven't looked in a while. That said, they did a collaboration, Omega did, with Swatch. Mm-hmm. And at first glance, you think like, oh, Swatch, like, there's no way. Like, I, what, why would I want? But the actual collaboration looks amazing. Like, it looks wow. just like the Speedmaster. It looks like, identical, minus identical. the band. Right, right, exactly. It's super, super similar. Mm-hmm. It's got the chronograph. It's made out of this ceramic that is super durable. They just crushed it, and they made them in a whole variety of different colors. They're mm-hmm. really, and they, they put a different planet at the bottom of, of each one. So this one is Saturn right here, this, this brown mm-hmm. version. They're impossible to get, and you have to buy them in the store. You can't get them on eBay, but if you go into the stores, they actually have a limit to the supply. They, they kind of dole out each day. What's the price range? Or the cost two hundred and fifty or two hundred and ninety dollars, something like that. So definitely cheaper than a hundred thousand dollars, and cheaper than five thousand dollars. And you get the exact look of the Speedmaster. Yeah, and it's it's so it's such a fun watch. It's a super iconic watch. Yeah. So if you're like always been Speedmaster curious or want to have one of the most iconic looks in terms of watches, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Well, that's why I went from Godspeed to to here. You can see the jump. Yeah. I see it. <laughs> it it's, it's, it's just a cool watch. And you got to see all the it different colors, watch. man. So they call it the, the moon swatch instead of the moon watch. So it's the That's moon clever. swatch from Speedmaster and swatch collaboration. Yeah, just always trying to find something that is, you know, holidays are not that far off. If you have a watch lover or, or someone in your life that you want to do a gift to, great gifts as well. So it's kind of fun. For folks who may not know, also, the Swatch Group is the world's largest watch company, employs about 36,000 people in 50 countries. They own a whole line Huge. of different brands, including Omega. Yes, that's why this happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there you go. And you have to imagine the people at Omega were pissed. I, I Just knowing so much about this industry. They might. They might have been like, we decline your suggestion. And then the parent company was like, no, this isn't a suggestion. Right. This is exactly. what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. Like, this is actually happening. <laughs> and I will say that, and you know this, I don't generally wear any kind of jewelry or watches or anything. Very, very little adornment. But I was gifted as a very beautiful, thoughtful gift, a Speedmaster by a friend of mine. And it is, it is a very, it feels good to wear Mm. this watch. And also if you want to, it's kind of like guys who have really good mustache or beard game. Like they think the women are going to be into it and then they just constantly get compliments from guys that will also happen if you're wearing one of these things. Oh, a hundred percent. And the fact that you can get though, that swatch for those people who are not watching the video, that collaboration, it looks just like the speedy pro. I mean, it, it really does. One thing that is worth mentioning there on this, on this watch, that for those that want to know kind of like the, the two-second geeky backstory, is that Neil Armstrong not only wore this watch to the moon, but used the chronograph feature to time the, the, the propulsion and jet releases to land on the moon. So it's like, talk about like he had to use a device it's like there isn't computers to do this. A mechanical device. A mechanical device <laughs> on his wrist. And so this, that's why this watch is like <laughs> legit, like, uh, like it's a real true utilitarian, like awesome tool. So mm-hmm. it's pretty awesome. Yeah. You can imagine if there were some wrist bound computer used for like the first human landing on another planet. Yeah. And then that was made available in limited supply for civilians to buy like what that would what that would hold in terms well, did of you meaning about the sealed first iphone went for over a hundred thousand dollars at auction no i did not yeah. hear <laughs> i mean that was just a few years ago 
That's wild. I did not know that. Now, you mentioned one thing, though. I'm curious about You said it, it's not, you can't find it on eBay. How does a company pull that off? No, you, I'm sorry, you can find it on eBay. Oh, you can. Yeah, that All is right. the place. You have to either go in store, like to an ac- actual a swatch store, or on eBay. There's the only two places. I got it. it. You can get it used, or if you want it new, you have to go to the store. Right. Like you can't go to swatch.com and buy it directly from the site, mm-hmm. it won't ship it to you. What else you got? I got a lot. Yeah, yeah. Bring another one on, and then I'll I'll, right. I'll choose an appropriate transition from from one I'll of them. I'll bring a, a quickie, and then and then I've got some really hard hitters after that. The quickie is that I'm relaunching my love podcast. quickies. I just want you to I keep love, saying it. I really love quickies. <laughs> I'm relaunching my podcast. I'm, I'm actually doing it and getting back in the game. Which podcast are we talking about? So I had the Kevin Rose show from back in the day. I yeah. shut it down for maybe it's been about a year and a half, two years ago. And I, I've missed it. I missed a lot of kind of what I was doing there, but also I want to kind of modify it in a few different ways. Now, this is separate from, unless I'm already, I've had a third of a glass of wine, so maybe I'm just hallucinating already, but Foundation? Were yeah, those so foundation, two separate? The Foundation and Kevin Rose Show kind of merged into one. So it's still one feed, because Foundation was all about interviewing entrepreneurs, talking about their entrepreneurial kind of journey trials, mm-hmm. tribulations, things of that nature. Kevin Rose Show. Yeah, was speaking of other bit. planets, you did have Elon on at one point. Yes. This is back in the day. Yeah. So that's actually what kind of what I want to get back to where when I, when I think about some of the value that I was able to add to my listeners, it was around, and, and, and something that I think I've personally been good at is identifying trends early on and talking about mm-hmm. them before anyone else. So, yeah, you, know, you are, just to underscore that, you are undeniably one of the best in the world I've ever seen at that. I appreciate that, man. That means, it's it means, true. It's true. Means I've seen it you, over dude. and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's funny, incredible. Someone has a clip of me mentioning Ethereum for the first time on your show. Have you seen that? Yeah, oh, we did like, a random not, show. It was, it, it was like 1985. I mean, yeah, it was, a, it was way back I'm in like, my apartment in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So getting back to that, like just really wanting to, you know, highlight and expose people to that early beta, beta, I think of like early software, right? And so the mm-hmm. tentative working title is called beta, but it's going to be like showing off things as early as possible that have potentially a lot of upside for the user. So advancements in AI, you know, when I had Elon on the show back in the day, Tesla stock was $1.90. I looked up the, the price of when he actually came on the show. Holy shit. Which is crazy. So, you know, it's going to be a variety show. It's going to cover tech, investing, you know, health. And then I think also important to throw in there is, is, is this kind of mental work-life balance that is so important to me these days where it's, yes, investing is great. Yes, making money is great, but it's not going to bring you happiness unless you can figure out the shit in your head. So just making sure that's a component to it as well. Mm-hmm. So anyway don't have anything to announce, but I would tell people if by the time this show comes out, if you just go to kevinrose.com, you'll see a link to the podcast there. How fun. And I'm going to fire it back up. Do you have any teasers for likely or possible guests? Could be names, could be just profiles. It's a great question. I had sent Elon an email a while ago, and he said he had a lot of fun on my first show and was game to do it again. That was a while ago, but I got to go and, and hit him back up. I would definitely want to have Elon back on. That's going to be a good one. Mm-hmm. But I would say, you know, there's three or four, but uh, nobody is confirmed. I really want to kick it off with a good banger to, to begin. Yeah. So TBD. TBD. Well, let me tell you about something exciting on my side, which is really just... Uh, celebration at this point of enthusiasm for me. It's not a launch or anything like that at this point, but you don't know about this. Nobody knows about this really, which is I recently, last week, did a, I guess it was a four-day creative sprint in the middle of nowhere at this rustic retreat with two writers and three concept artists who are some of the best in the world, who have done some of the best known work for D&D, for Magic the Gathering, and we worked on cock punch stuff, believe it or not. We actually spent that entire time coming up with scenarios, characters, adventures, concept sketches, artwork, 
I don't want to spoil the surprise, but made some significant tweaks to the nature of that realm that I think are very, very, very compelling and got tons and tons of artwork. And it's spectacular. Some of the work is is just outrageously, outrageously good. What these guys can do in a handful of hours, it, it boggles my mind. It is just beyond my comprehension. It's, it's really it, it, as if from the writing perspective, if someone sat down and like in three hours, they just banged out like 3000 perfect words. I'm like, what? How's that humanly possible? Like I yeah. saw that with these artists, they were so well-oiled, so professional, and also had very different styles, which was super fun. So I could watch them also feeding off one another, mm-hmm. even though they were working on different aspects, different greater houses and so on. And for me, part of the celebration is realizing that even though it was my first go around, my first rodeo, and I didn't quite know what I was doing, of course, it was an experiment in collaboration because I've been such a solo act. I've been such a Mm. soloist when it comes to large creative projects, having an opportunity to work with, say, not just one 3D artist, which I did, Walter, for, say, the initial three-dimensional 3D blender character designs, but to work with an entire group and to see if I can actually interact or co-manage that process in some way was very reassuring. I think I can do it. I think I, I think that even if I'm not putting pen to paper or stylus to to a tablet in some fashion, I think the the past that I have and the experience that I have with line art and more recently with painting and so on really helps me to give better feedback to artists and to yeah. notice details. And I'm very excited about it. There's a few things I want to comment on here. One, it's awesome to see, and it's so apparent to me now that you know you launch this as a NFT project, and NFTs yep. are are having a, a bad time right now. It's, <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's, it's definitely one way to put it. <laughs> it's, it's a bloody market out there. All the yeah. proceeds went to nonprofit. Yeah, royalties are dead. So the idea yep. that you're making any further money on this via NFTs is is not the case. Basically zero. Yep. And so you're doing this for the love of the game, which I love to see, which is yeah. awesome. And the second and more important thing, having known you for a long, long time, is I've never seen you, I've, I've seen you struggle with giving up a little bit of creative control, right? Like delegation, yep. like if, if you know, if so, I'll give you some old Tim Fair stories. Every time Tim <laughs> would write a new book... I'd be like, dude, Tim, let me get a let me get a little early copy. Let me get a little chapter. Let me see what you're working on. What do you what hacks are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You would like, you wouldn't share that shit with anybody. You were like so secretive. You'd like, how do I encrypt my hard drive? Like you would like try and lock down all your shit. But but to see you move into this this world of more of creative director is is awesome. Has that been a challenge for you? Am I am I articulating that correctly? That's you are. A, a, yeah, you're definitely articulating it correctly. I mean, I think as we were talking about before we started recording, like we, we both have some maybe daddy trust issues or whatever that we've needed to work through on a lot of fronts. And it's definitely the case that that's true. I will say that there are a few decisions that were super key in facilitating sort of lubricating, if you will, the possibility of me being a acting in a more creative director role. So the the first was, and it's easy to miss the importance of this with the absurdity of the name of the project, right? Cock Punch, The Legend right. of Cock Punch. <laughs> People should check out the trailer at the very least oh on God, the podcast, the episode one. It's so good. Uh, <laughs> some amazing voice actors involved. And the key there, right, by using that name, and this was very deliberate, and by pursuing it the way I pursued it, and also giving the funds to the SAISE Foundation, my foundation, S-A-I-S-E-I foundation.org, for people who want to see the projects I'm involved with. What that did is it basically made fixating on money kind of silly in the sense that it doesn't go to my pocket. It's going to the foundation, which is important, but it's not going to directly improve the quality of my life in any way. Secondly, the fact that 
it was given such an absurd slash hilarious title allowed me not to take it too seriously or be too precious or protective of it. And that is what opened the door to this collaboration. My hope is that by testing this with something like cock punch that I will then be able to translate it to things that I might be inclined to be more protective with. Mm. And uh, there have been so many benefits to this. And I'll name a few, or I'll at least lead with one, which is the energy that this has generated has been unbelievable. It's been like a power plant for everything else that I'm doing. So it's, it's charging my batteries so effectively that I've been able to engage much more potently with everything else. And this is creative energy from the creativity of it all? Creative energy. So for instance, it's sort of admin paper cutty stuff that is so easy to succumb to as a sort of death by a thousand paper cuts. Like, mm -hmm. look, you need to do your taxes. There are things you need to do that you don't really want to do that deplete, at least in my case, kind of deplete my batteries. And if you don't have something on the other side of the ledger to recharge those mm. batteries, you can end up being really fatigued. You just don't have extra calories to allocate to a lot of things. And this silly project, which has achieved a lot of serious things, right? I mean, like millions of dollars have gone to the foundation or at least two million bucks and there's more that's going to go because I'm going to be uh, soon, I'll be donating all the secondary royalty revenue also to the foundation. I mean, it's, it's done a lot of good in terms of supporting early stage science at all sorts of top universities and journalism fellowships at UC Berkeley and so on. But check this out. This will be another connection. And that is, I literally, and we'll see if I can keep this in or not, <laughs> but I need to talk to the Same other person. Good. Yeah. I just signed my first ever writing collaboration agreement to work on my first book in six years with another person. I've never mm. done that before in my life. And like, that's my baby, right? I'm, is this fiction? This is nonfiction. It'll be nonfiction. It'll be sort of old school Tim Ferriss in a sense, because it'll be what I'm probably best at and most known for. But it will Ooh. be done with you someone. an hour to the week? <laughs> Inflation, baby. Inflation. <laughs> it's Five a song. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to be the five-hour work week. You know what's funny is you can release that and people will be like, oh, shit, he figured out something new and it'd be like a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> the first through fourth hour are all about work and the fifth hour is all about pleasure. Here we go, folks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Epicurean 2.0. So I, I am beyond excited about this because this is now right segueing from cutting my teeth on some collaboration with this thing called cog punch mm -hmm. but now i've segued to my actual bailiwick right down the middle with hardcore nonfiction, super tactical nonfiction, and i'm going to work with someone else and i never i don't think there's any chance i would have been able to do that had i not deliberately created something that I didn't feel too protective or precious about. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fucking stoked, man. I'm really excited. Let me ask you a question. How do you decide to, in, in, as a general tip for the audience out there, how and when do you decide to outsource things to other people that you would consider to be representative of yourself or your brand or in some way could be potentially damaging. Like I think about this has been a hard one for me because anytime an app ships or anytime, you know, anything happens that is associated with a company that I have started, if there's something breaks or it's not done the correct way, it's always like, Oh, Kevin, why didn't you catch this? Blah, blah. And I'm like, I did. I got there's Now that's what other, other people, people say to you or that's what you say to you. Both. Right. So yeah. they, they, they somehow think I'm doing everything. Right. And so they'll be like, it's impossible <laughs> that you didn't catch this. And I'm like, I didn't see it before it went out, you know? And so I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering when you, because your brand is so important to protect, like, yeah. how do you, who has final edit on your podcast? Like, how did you trust them with that? Right. Because yeah. like, 
Totally. This is a great Otherwise, question. You'd have to listen to yeah. every single podcast you ever did in great detail. And we've never talked about this. This is fun. All right. I've never talked about this publicly. So I am slow to give up the reins. I'm very slow. And I'm slow to trust in general, as you know. And there's some upside to that. There's there are also a bunch of downsides. But <laughs> love it or hate it, that is that is where we are. I'm very hyper vigilant in that way. In the case of the podcast, first step after each podcast is recorded, before I even send my edit notes or anything like that, is the podcast is transcribed. And there are some great tools out mm-hmm. there that can interact with transcripts that we have also tested and used in the past, like Descript. We use Descript too, yeah. Right, which is really helpful for people who don't know. It allows you to say strip out all the ums and ahs and filler words automatically. And you make text edits that then get translated into audio edits. It's very interesting. I I also use professional sound editors and so on. But step one for all of that is getting the audio transcribed. So we get the audio transcribed. And at this point, I have something like 700 episodes, close to 700 episodes, which for those who are wondering is... It's pretty crazy. Next April, I think it's next April, is going to be 10 years of the podcast. Can you fucking believe that? It's crazy. 10 years, 1.4 episodes on average per week for 10 years straight. Did you have hair when we started? I can't even remember. I don't think. I probably had a little more hair. My hair probably looked like my beard (laughs) right now. (laughs) So it wasn't much. I definitely didn't have gray hair. Yeah, I wasn't going to be on any of those poster boards where they show you all the haircuts that are possible at the barber. It's very old school, right? Like, ooh, I want the flat top. I want that one. I wouldn't have been on any of those, but I probably had a little more hair. I was probably faking it. I, was, I think I was probably at the last, the 11th hour of my white knuckling. I probably had some cheesy faux hawk because that's all that was left and I was trying to cover up bald spots, something like that. In any case, the point I was going to make is that my current general manager of the podcast, who's really the COO of editorial, has been working for me for seven or eight years. We've been working together a long time. Over that period of time, we've now done a few hundred episodes together, minimum. And I started with making edits myself in a Google Doc. And then we would go back and forth. And over time, I got to the point where I would ask him to suggest edits. And then I would go through and provide refinements and feedback. And I am at the point now where we probably have 95% overlap, which is good enough. And I therefore feel very comfortable with letting him make the vast majority of edit decisions related to the podcast. How long did that take you? Was that like a year process? At least a year. Yeah, at least a year. Because you're really training someone to do two things. One is to understand how you think well enough, my decision-making process, so that they can step into the shoes or into the mind of Tim Ferriss to look at a transcript. Mm -hmm. The second is to be the best version of their editorial selves for using judgment. And it's the combination that works really well. So I would say it takes, it took me probably... In his case, his responsibilities expanded dramatically as we worked together over time. But I would say since he has effectively run the operation side of the podcast, probably took a year and a half to two years is what I would say. Yeah. And I think it can be done much more quickly for people who really focus on it and who don't have the trust issues that I have. I think you could, I think you could, if you have a high enough volume of podcasts, which I have directly throttled, I used to do say at, at times six, seven episodes a a month, because you have all of these other interview based podcasts that are doing four or five a week. And I felt like that was a trend that I should, uh, not a trend I should follow, but that was certainly in my economic best interest to Mm -hmm. publish more episodes and people were consuming them. But I started to drag my feet and realized it was starting to feel 
like a job in the sense that I, I really was not looking forward to my conversations after the fourth or fifth or sixth right. of a month. So I dialed back deliberately so that I would still enjoy what I was doing. What that meant, though, is that you're getting fewer iterations or you're getting fewer at-bat practices with the person you're trying to train to be a world-class editor. And I think you could do it if you had decent volume. You could probably do it in three months. Yeah. Especially, for instance, one thing that I could have done, I just didn't think of it and I didn't have really the bandwidth. I'm just juggling a lot and it wasn't my absolute top priority. You don't have to use new audio, right? I could have said, let's take the raw audio from 20 episodes that were published before. Mm. Or if you, if you have a friend who's a podcaster, you could have said, give me 20 of your episodes. Yeah. And then have him run through it and then i would run through it and boom before you know it if the person is reasonably adaptive and perceptive they'll figure it out so i would say three to six months but i'm at a point now where it's, it's at least 95 percent overlap and if there's something that's very nuanced that i feel strongly about i will still make that edit myself and some of it is some of it is really 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 nuanced mm -hmm. right let's just say a guest gives a long answer. In the middle of that answer, they say something that's factually incorrect. And for my audience and also for the guests themselves, I want to remove that. But if I remove it, perhaps that removes a bunch of important context. So I may need to take something from elsewhere in the conversation and slot it in or create a hybrid sort of Frankenstein for it to make sense or ask them to do a pickup meaning record additional audio to slot in somewhere that is at a level of complexity and also like Tim Ferriss subjective whim that I will often step in to try to make some yeah. of those decisions. But my right hand makes a lot of the decisions on his own that's now amazing. and it's incredible. So that's, that's been the process. And there is, I will say to, to put out a really good finished episode. Oftentimes there is a fuck ton of work that happens behind the scenes that if we do our jobs correctly are completely invisible. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For me, it's, it's, a, it's a, obviously a different can of worms in running a startup in a, in a business, but I think of it kind of through this lens where one just a hundred percent, not taking shortcuts when it comes to hiring, just hiring yeah. absolute a plus players or what you believe to be a plus players from day one. Mm hmm. I really, when I was working at Google and you walk in the door and you get to see who you're surrounded and who your peers are, it's very apparent that that is like, there's a reason why their hiring process is so long. And so kind of a little bit tedious, but just it, it's quite the complex, several hurdles that you have to get over before you actually get in the door. And I, yeah. I understand why they, those hurdles are so high now. Because once you get in, they give you the kind of the keys to the castle and say, just go run, make mistakes, learn. And they trust you a lot. And so for me, once we have, you know, I know I have high quality talent to work with, it comes down to if this were to go completely sideways, how big of screw up would it be publicly into our community? And if the answer is a six or above, I probably want to give it a little bit more hands-on attention. And if the answer is like an eight or above, then I want to be heavily involved in that process, right? Mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a kind of five or below, who cares? Like, let them make the yeah. mistake. And, and yeah. go, because you just don't have time to look at everything, right? Not only that, but you don't want your employees and look, I think you're better the at this than I am. Micromanaging side, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, right? It's like... You don't want them to feel like you're the teacher looking over their shoulder to like point out every mistake they make as they're working, which has been hard for me to learn, honestly, because I am such a perfectionist. I don't know if I told you this. Did I tell you that I was diagnosed with moderate severe OCD by a psychiatrist? Did I tell you oh, this? Oh, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> that all makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What was funny? What was funny is that I went through this long thing, and then the psychiatrist was like, "Okay, I feel like I have a very confident read on uh, our our current state of play and the diagnosis." And he so he tells me all this, 
<laughs> and he says, we're on Zoom. And he's like, I understand this could be a lot to take in. If you need time, we can take a break. If you want to hop oh, on the Jesus. call and pick up tomorrow. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I'm like, what's next? That's fine. <laughs> Dude, it's so funny you say that. I've got a, an awesome new therapist that I'm really enjoying. She's amazing. And she's like, I want to refer you to someone because I what you're describing sounds like ADHD. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. Like, like <laughs> big surprise, you know? Like <laughs> shocker, shocker. Yeah, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> it literally happened a week ago. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I reached out to a couple of my ex girlfriends who I'm friendly with and I asked them, I was like, does this like square with your experience? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it squares with my experience. I was like, yeah, okay, confirmed. And this was in just to provide the context, this was in the context of trying to determine neuroanatomical targets for something referred to as accelerated TMS, which I'm hoping to talk quite a bit more about, but I, I don't feel comfortable yet making any type of recommendation, but it is a, a new protocol with a, a very, I shouldn't say very old, but like 1980s-ish forward developing technology, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So it's it's brain stimulation for the purposes of minimizing or eliminating the symptoms of certain things like OCD, yeah. depression, generalized, or maybe it's just general anxiety disorder. I think it's generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. And I become very interested in this because there are data related to something that's been called the SAINT protocol. I think that had too many religious overtones, so they abbreviated to think maybe SNT. It's a Stanford-based brain stimulation lab. There's some incredible scientists involved, including Nolan Williams, who's incredibly impressive to me, who have developed this protocol. And the magnitude of effect that I have seen in some of the data, this does not apply to all the people, does not apply to all conditions, but shows a magnitude of effect that makes it equally as interesting to me as psychedelic-assisted therapies. It's the mm. only thing I have come across in the last five years that approaches the amplitude of effect size that you see in some of these results. It's yeah, but it's bananas, but it's very intense by accelerated TMS. What that means is you're getting your brain zapped Yeah, and it's not technically whatever. We don't have to get into zapping. It's using magnetism, but you fucking feel it. Let me, let me, yeah. let me make it very clear. You are getting zapped for, and I could be getting some of the specifics wrong, but I've gone through one cycle of this already. You're getting zapped for something like eight and a half to 10 minutes every hour on the hour for 10 hours a day for five days straight. So you're doing 50 sessions in five days. And it's a hell of a thing. But that is why I was undergoing this psychiatric evaluation was to determine what the diagnosis was such that they could try to determine which coordinates to use basically in placement of the stimulation. Super, mm. super, super, super interesting. But the reason I brought that up is <laughs> winding all the way back to kind of where we started. I notice really minute details and that means also every mistake, every like I could I could scan a document. I don't know if you're like this, but like I can look at a document that four lawyers have reviewed and find stuff. Wow. And I just have that ability. I don't know what it is. It's it's definitely not all blessing. There's a lot of curse to that, but it's like I can I could scan a document reading very quickly and be like, this clause is off, that punctuation is off, this uh, in minutes in a way that like a living chat gpt yeah or a rain man in some respects <laughs> but that comes with a, f a huge tax yeah because right? it drives other people crazy right and you drive yourself crazy and so i'm learning to contend with that which is a way of emphasizing how big a deal it is for me to collaborate in the way that i'm describing yeah i will say also that the objective for the creative offsite for me 
was to try to create a flywheel of collaborative potential. And I'll explain what that means. In other words, I wanted to create enough imagery, enough artwork, also enough scaffolding in terms of world building. So the mythologies, the beliefs, the alliances, the conflicts, the geography, such that I could take all of that and give it as a world Bible of sorts to a writer who's never had any exposure to the realm of Varlata, right? The legend of Cockpunch. And they would be equipped to write a short story or a module or an adventure for D&D, a campaign, who knows, or a comic book and have it align with my creative vision for that entire fantasy world, which was a, a cool challenge. I think you require, I think it requires a little more time. Those types of creative pushes are often two to three weeks. Three weeks seems to be the sweet spot, but that's a huge ask of my time and of everyone's mm -hmm. time. And I wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable in a shorter format first, but man, I'm excited because what, what a lot of people don't realize is <laughs> this whole legend of cock punch thing. The only thing I need to do to make this something serious is change the name. I don't need to change yes, anything about the world. I told you that. Yes. It's actually really easy. Like if I wanted to switch that gear, which I think would be a terrible handicap right now because I want to continue to collaborate. And by having the current branding, it alleviates a lot of pressure I might apply to it. There's very little I have to do to flip a switch and make this a Will you extremely do that? viable. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I think Maybe. you should. You know, it, Remember when we had this conversation, I called you up and I said, dude, if you do these three things, this shit's going to take off. And one of them was the, the name change. Yeah, of course. Of course. I know it's a possibility. Right now, it is working so well as a creative hyperdrive and as a catalyst for just... <laughs> it's like having my own fusion reactor or something. It's working so well that I'm like, look, don't don't get too clever. Like you can fuck things up by being too clever. I was like, don't get too clever. Like this is working really well. You lucked into a lot of it. Some of it's by design, but you got really lucky. Like ride the lightning for a while. Don't fuck it up. So I'm gonna stick with it for a while. There's no I don't feel also any time pressure whatsoever. Can I ask you a question that I hope you'll give me a more kind of vulnerable response to. Oh boy. So <laughs> no, this is, this is a good one though, because you know, from an outsider looking in, you say, okay, Tim, you've told us, so this is just my observations. Mm -hmm. you, you say over and over legend of cock punch. It's a joke. It's, it's for fun. It's a throwaway. Mm -hmm. I'm having a good time. Don't want to take it too seriously, blah, blah, blah. But you know, in some sense, let me just think about how to word this. In some sense, if you did take it seriously, now you're a sci you're not a sci-fi, but you're a, a fiction writer. Yeah, fantasy writer. Mm -hmm. Fantasy writer. And you could go for it. You could decide at some point to go for it and say, I want to try this. But there's also a sense that it could fail. And you're protected right now from failure because of the name. Mm -hmm. So is that just a safety mechanism to keep you from feeling failure? Or do you see what I'm saying? Like if we're being really vulnerable Yeah, I here? do. I do. It's a great question. So here's, here's what I would say. It's actually, in a sense, the opposite for me. So it's not a throwaway. It's definitely not a throwaway. It is something, I think, very profound, at least for me personally, that is in the guise of something ridiculous which I think more people should try, honestly, because you, mm. it's actually a cheat code. And I would say that instead of, of using it to avoid the possibility of failure, what it is enabling me to do is, is fucking swing for the fences in ways that I would never dare otherwise that could result in just a complete face plant. Mm. So I'm actually risking many, many, many different types of failure that I would be hugely averse to otherwise by couching it in the terms that I've been using. And I am going to do so much more of this in life. Holy shit. Like this 
has been such an unlock for me that I'm going to do a lot more of it. And I'll mention a few other things just quickly <laughs> because it ties into this. That's the nature of the random show. Let me just yes. pull out a random piece of paper from the hat and we'll go from there. There's a great book. It's actually excellent for storytelling in general, although it is comic specific. It was recommended to me by a very good artist and creative who works in comics named Danielle Henriquez or Enriquez, the DC Comics Guide to Writing Comics, which is such a boring title for mm -hmm. a really entertaining and useful book. But the DC Comics Guide to Writing Comics by Dennis O'Neill, it has sample scripts. It shows you side-by-side -side script plus final output. It goes into story arcs. Not all of it would apply to what I want to do, but it was incredibly, I found it incredibly useful and also hilarious. The writing itself is spectacular. I thought it was spectacular by Dennis O'Neill, so I want to give a, a hats off to him. And in terms of fiction, <laughs> so it would be, I would be very insecure if I were to take fiction writing, prose only, on in, say, novel or book form because there are some people who are so, so good at it. For people out there who have not read any, say, fantasy fiction, we could certainly get into science fiction. I'm a huge fan of science fiction. Ted Chang, I'll just say that, C-H-I-A-N-G, the, sh the collection is just short stories. If you want some, Oh, that, it's not like eight short stories or something like that in one book? Yeah, exactly. That was really good. I, maybe you, you, you said that a couple of years ago, you recommended that. Yeah, I, read it. It I mean, fantastic. he's absurdly, absurdly good. The movie Arrival so was based on one of his short stories. I mean, the guy is so, so, to so To be able good. to pack that much information, like that dense of storytelling in such a short little, it, it just like, it, it brings you in so quickly. It, yeah. It's unbelievable, right? His ability to like turn your brain inside out yes, with exactly. new concepts right. in a short story is in like 15 pages. unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's, unbel it's unbelievable. So Ted Chang for science fiction would be my starting point. And then you can try the longer stuff. But for fantasy, if people, Lord of the Rings is just too much for people to chew on, generally. The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. I think Daria has read that, actually, because I she recommended read it. almost all sci-fi. She read The Graveyard Book. The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman is usually my, my like, what would you call it? My trainer for people who are nonfiction purists, who are like, fiction is dumb, I don't want to read fiction. I'll usually break them in with The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, usually audiobook because these people are like, I'm fucking busy. I'm like, okay, fine. Well, listen while you're walking the dog or doing the dishes or whatever. The Graveyard Book, read by Neil Gaiman. The Ensemble is great, but don't do the Ensemble cast, read by Neil Gaiman. And then the other one is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which is fucking incredible. And I recommended it to a friend. I hadn't read it in 10 years or something. And my friend, who is a fucking snob when it comes to <laughs> writing, he has very high standards. He reads excellent books. And he he ripped through the two books that are part of the series, the King Killer Chronicles, in like four days. These are long books, and it completely blew his mind, which got me very excited to read more fiction. But I I didn't have a good lead until these concept artists. At least I think one of the concept artists and one of the writers. At least it was like three out of five or something said you have to read the blade itself by Joe Abercrombie, and I'm in the middle of listening to the blade itself by Joe Abercrombie. And it is really fun. It is really, mm. really, really good. I've, I've really been enjoying it. So on the creative side, I'm soaking myself in masters of fiction, but I don't have the balls yet. Or I, let me put it a different way. It's not a balls issue. It's, I don't have the hubris to want to take that on right now. I realize I have a lot of skill development to, focus on. And I think that my sweet spot will actually be potentially comics. I really think comics mm. might be my sweet spot. That'd be awesome. Yeah, because I have the visual sensibility. I mean, I do have the sort of 
directorial visual capacity, I can think about all of that very easily. So I, I could see you really, really enjoying that. And I want to recommend one other thing, which is there's a very short, it's not really a TED talk, but it's on TED. There's a nine minute monologue. And what's genius about it is that he's such a good actor that he makes it seem impromptu, but you know he rehearsed the shit out of it, right? It takes a lot of practice to make something seem like it's impromptu. <laughs> and it's Ethan Hawke, the actor. And it is a short TED Talk. It's like nine minutes long called Give Yourself Permission to Be Creative. And holy shit, it is so good and so powerful. I really, really recommend everybody check it out. I'm writing it down right now. Such an easy lift. Amazing. Yeah. So speaking All of right. TED Talks, th thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Kevin, you're up. <laughs> yeah. So well, one thing I wanted to, you know, we talked about that brain stimulation stuff. And, you know, Adam Ghazali, our mutual friend at UCSF, has been experimenting yeah. with some of that stuff as well. For a long time. For a long time. He's one, long, of, the, he's one of the pros. Yeah. Long time. One thing that I will say our mutual friend, Matt Walker, who runs the Berkeley Sleep Lab, Mm -hmm. Have you talked to Matt about brain stimulation at all? No, I, you know, I, God, what a fucking, I'm really on like my Long Island self right now. My F-bombs are at a high density for this episode. I literally took a note like 10 minutes ago to catch up with Matt Walker because I haven't caught up with him in a while. So yes, yeah, I've been thinking about, about Matt. Nice He's such earth, a sweet guy, right? but I haven't talked to him about brain stim. I have not. So Matt is, and this is by no means an ad, I'm not involved at all. He's an, a scientific advisor for a company called Somni, S-O-M-N-E-E. -E. He sent me one of the devices. I haven't tried it yet, but I have it sitting next to my bed, oddly enough, as one does. But you wear it for 15 minutes before you go to sleep, and it's supposed to just really improve your sleep quality through via brain stimulation. So huh. definitely okay. check that out. And I know that, you know, obviously he wouldn't sign on to something unless he believed the science was solid. And he was uh, very excited about this. It's a, it's a tough hurdle as a, as, a, as a startup to get people to be, feel comfortable stimulating their brain <laughs> with currency. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's really promising. And, and, and Matt was impressed with, with the results. So if, you're, if you have trouble with All sleep, right. definitely check it out. And, and Matt's obviously oh a legend. This story of my life. Good Lord. Yeah. So I will talk to Matt. He's, he is genuinely such a brilliant, but moreover, sweet guy. He's just one of the sweetest guys I've ever oh, met. He's nice. Like, I kind of want to like write him into my will and have him watch my kids if I die or something. Yeah, seriously. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I know I met you a year ago, but can you be the godfather to my unborn <laughs> children, please? You've never met them, but uh, <laughs> exactly. He's the sweetest guy. Such a sweet guy. All right, so I know you have a bunch of stuff. What else yeah. what, what else are you holding back here? So, you know, speaking of just crazy shit early that I want to tell you about, I think about tech, well, technology startups in general, we all know 90% of them fail. Some of them are so odd, they're worth mentioning because if they become something larger, you'll want to have heard about it, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of those. So there is a site out there. It is called friend.tech. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. I don't so think so. You get a sign up code. They're posting them all over Twitter. They'll, somebody you'll know will have one. And when you go in, what they have realized and what Apple has done is Apple has said, you must pay us a 20% tax on all transactions, right? Yep. And so. And they've also banned cryptocurrency trading from the app store. Like they don't allow that to happen. They allow you to have wallets, but they, they, and they allow you to buy from like Coinbase, but they, as payments, they haven't yet enabled that, right? So some clever individuals have figured out that they, back in the day, they have a way with Safari, the little browser built into the iPhone, to install apps on the phone that aren't actually from the app store. Oh, that's wild. Okay. Yeah. I see where this is going. <laughs> okay. So what they've done is somebody created called something called friend.tech. And when you sign in with your Twitter and off in your Twitter, it creates a profile for you. It gives you a place to post to your followers. 
you can post out and they can all respond back, but they can't see each other's responses. So it's almost like a private DM that is coming from them to you. But whenever you send something out, it goes to everyone. Okay. Now, what happens though, is you get one share of yourself to begin with. And they call them keys now because they realize the SEC might freak out about that. And (laughs) they're tokenizing humans via a bonding curve. So what? What does that mean? That means think of bonding curves like a slippery slide, like a a child's slide. And if you had to place a toy car on the bottom of the slide, when if you're early and you're the first one, you're buying in at the ground floor. But as the car starts to go up the slide, which is the predefined curvature of the bonding curve, it becomes more and more pricey. So if I buy Tim Ferriss as user number one, I might pay 10 cents a share for Tim Ferriss. And the next person might pay 15 cents. The next person might pay 20. And then it goes up from there, right? All right. And it's all done in Ethereum, but they do it on a layer two which is another complex way of saying they kind of take it off chain or not on the main chain. So that it only costs pennies to do these transactions. And so so you're dodging Apple and you're dodging the gas fees. Right. So think of this, like imagine this is like a new type of only fans, but for everyday content. So if Twitter can have subscriptions, only fans can have, you know, fetishes about whatever. (laughs) I don't even want to name any because I've seen some <laughs> weird shit. I've heard about some weird shit. Oh, nice, nice safe. <laughs> nice safe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> this allows them to dodge the micro payments. And it, it is more or less. It, so I signed up. I was like, what the hell? I'm just going to try this. But here's the crazy thing, Tim. As people buy and sell you, a, a percentage of that goes back to you as the creator, the content creator. So I didn't know that going into this. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to buy and sell some of my friends. And so I haven't sold anybody yet. I just bought Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. When you're saying buy and sell some of your friends or you're selling, not shares because the SEC will freak out, but whatever the keys. hell. The tr- keys. Keys yeah. in yourself. What do people get? What are, okay, so they pay for this thing. They get access to your feed. Ah, uh, all right. So if okay, you signed right. up, I'd so be it's like, like. So it's like an Ethereum denominated Patreon in a way. Something yes, like that? Exactly. But it's based on a bonding curve. So the sooner you get in, the better. And then there's okay. as you exit down, it follows the same curve down. So as you mm-hmm. sell shares. So, you know, Nadia from Pussy Riot, I paid for hers. <laughs> and and she posts she posts some some things on, oh, on wow. her feed. Oh, that's and very so nice. That, I mean, not Nadia's a be- beautiful woman. Uh, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> and... <laughs> So, so as, act, as Kevin just access, showed his iPhone screen to the video for those who want to check in on the, the video. video version. <laughs> yeah. hey, listen, Daria, Daria likes her. She told uh, Daria that she has a nice ass, so my wife is okay with her. Oh wow! I, I nice. don't even know if I, I should be bringing this up right now. I've had two glasses yeah. of wine. Man. Right, so, dude, female politics are so oh, next level. So like, next dudes level. are just playing checkers, and women are playing three D chess. It's it's so know, much more cause, complicated. Cause, cause she goes, she goes to Daria like, oh, you have a really nice ass, and Daria's like, thank you. And then later, Daria's like, oh, she's had a nice ass. I'm like, what do I say? Like, oh, you both have nice asses. Like, what, what am I supposed to say? Like, you can't, there's nothing you can say to win. <laughs> You're like, I like food. I like ass. I would like some scrambled eggs now. Like, there's nothing you can say. You just got to go back to your normal program. Right? So anyway, she's a fun one to follow. But here's the funny thing is people are buying or selling me, right? And I wasn't aware of this. You get a cut of it. So, dude, I've got like almost three ETH in just royalties from people buying and selling me. So the people who are, oh God. So hold on a second. So if, if the, if it's, you get up. So here's what I'm guessing. So the people who are at the bottom of the slide are marking up and then selling their shares, their keys. Potentially. And Kevin. So let me ask you this. Are you ending up with the same scumbags that are so common in like web three land or are, Listen, or is it like something you don't have to deal with scumbags? I, I call them friends, but <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that I'm not saying everybody in those communities fits the description of scumbags, but there are a lot of fucking idiots. Like, let's be honest. Right. Yeah. I don't think you can block anyone here, but ever, so far everyone has been super nice. Yeah, okay, I only cool. have 38. Well, also, though. also because if, if, if it's a DM, they don't get any social reinforcement for being pricks, right? Yes, exactly. 
Yeah. But the, the, my point really is, is not so much about whether this is, I think the SEC comes in here at some point, this gets too big and is like, you know, this probably isn't right. But I, <laughs> there's something interesting about this idea of owning a portion of, it's like we, it's like when we were kids and you said, Hey, this band's going to be huge. Right. Mm -hmm. And you listen to a yeah, band, you get rewarded for being early. Yeah, exactly. And you were like, trust me, trust me. They're going to break out the song. This is just the beginning. And then, you know, they become the next Pearl Jam or whatever. And you're like, I told you, man, I was, I was early. I was a fan since day one. You know, this is a way to say I was a fan since day one and get rewarded for it at the same time. So it's, it's a fascinating social experiment. I don't know where it's going to go, but I think it's worth people just kicking the tires on it. And so the way you get rewarded then, if you're buying keys, God, that's awkward. That, that term is used for so yeah, many things, but whatever. Keys in someone. So I buy keys in Kevin Rose. The way I get rewarded is number one, access to the feed. Yes, yeah, so you're just going to get content. For Although I don't think your ass shots are going to be as good as the one that you no, showed me. No, but I have pictures me. of you that I haven't exposed yet, so I'll probably post them there. <laughs> All right, perfect. Can't wait. And then, secondly, the way you get rewarded is you can, I guess, sell some or all of your keys if you got in early. You get one share of your own self. You can buy more shares of your own self if you're bullish on yourself but i would not recommend going and, and selling yourself that just looks odd for me i've just gone out and bought a handful of other people that i respect or want to see their content and i'm just yeah i, I haven't sold anybody because i i think this is like a house of cards a little bit but Dude, I, what I happened to your play. knuckles what the fuck know, is going I, on i, I was building a, a kid's construction set my kid's house and fucked it up my middle knuckle looks like you've been punching cement blocks i know I, I do want to take some <laughs> boxing classes, though. That's That's been on my list of to-dos. Yeah, you should just don't get hit in the head. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, TBI does not help what you want to do. You, you could do... You, I mean, boxing is great. You will be... You will feel like you're about to die after three minutes of working on pads. Yeah. It is so unbelievably tiring, especially if you have a trainer who moves a lot and can avoid... <laughs> what you're trying to accomplish. Muay Thai also excellent for pad work. I've been thinking about getting back into Muay Thai, but I have to fix my spinal pain first. And uh, probably, I mean, Muay Thai is probably one of the worst things that I could possibly do right now, given the state of affairs. But boxing's great, man. And you'll have access to a lot of good gyms. Yeah, there's got to be some out here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go try and find a, a good one. Oh, yeah. Ton. You got tons of options. Yeah. Just skip the sparring. Skip the sparring. Yeah. Work on pads. Well, I mean, you could do light sparring though, right? With padded headgear. Like as long as it's not too I no. you know, here's he, let me explain what happens in light sparring with headgear. <laughs> so here's what happens with light sparring with headgear. <laughs> Is everyone's cool for like sixty seconds not. and then someone throws a punch that's a little too hard and they say, Oh, sorry, man, sorry. And the other person's like, Yeah, that's fine, no problem. And then then the other person throws a shot that's a little harder, and then before you know it, you're just fucking giving each other brain damage left and right. <laughs> <laughs> that, and then you both have a headache for three days, and you actually have real jobs, and it's a complete oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> waste of brain cells. So <laughs> the way that sparring, it's not really sparring, but the way that contact can make sense is if you have someone who's really good at holding mitts, you know, pads, mm -hmm. who will occasionally check you with with their own mm. hands but they have the pads on so they're not hitting you hard but they're giving like a that little feedback snap to the face that they, this is coming at you. yeah so you have to react and you have to develop some defensive capabilities that's i think that's tolerable yeah but but speaking as someone oh my god going through these psychiatric evaluations the number of questions related to concussions and traumatic brain injury is really beyond anything I would have expected. Like the correlation of depression, anxiety, et cetera, to TBI, to traumatic brain injury, is undeniable. So the, Yeah, it turns out fucking up your brain is going to fuck up your brain. Right. Well, yeah, but it's not immediately clear if you're, say, a skateboarder when you're a kid. Like I skateboarded, you did too. I'm sure you ate shit sometimes. and Like you whacked the, yeah. the, the living hell out of your head. I was actually talking to Tony Hawk about this because, you know, his mom passed from dementia and we were talking about, you know, some of the brain injuries and stuff that he's been through. And he's just like, you know, I, at the time, this was years ago, so I'm kind of paraphrasing, but at the time he's just like, you know, 
it's what I do. And yeah. he, he's like, it's what I do. And he's like, you're kind of too far in at that point, you know? Well, and yeah. I was like, yeah. and I talked to Rhonda Patrick and I was like, this is, this is many years ago. We were talking about Omega threes to get for Tony and just like stuff that we could potentially do to like, you know, give him some brain health, you know, it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. tough. He's, he's, he's seen some damage. Have you ever yeah. seen his shins? Oh, they must be terrible. I haven't. They're just, they're beat up, dude. It's like, he's, yeah, he's like a Muay Thai fighter. <laughs> dude, I have so much respect for that dude. I mean, talk yeah. about somebody that the last time I saw him was probably six months ago. And we went to this donut place that was opening up and he had a cane with him. And what? He's, yeah, he was a like, cane. Well, he had just had surgery. They, and he's oh, like, oh, I see. And I'm like, I'm like, how you doing, man? He's like, ah, you know, they just opened me up, put a few more screws in. He's like, I'll be, I'll be skating. Like, and you know, it's like, Dude, the dude just has no fear. Like, there's like no, yeah. there's, he's just like, ah, oh, they just open me up, put a few screws in, and I'm going to go back at it. Like, what the fuck, dude? Good for him. You're already the goat. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, Laird Hamilton, same with surfing, right? He's just like, yeah, get patched up. I'm back out there. Like, that's just insane. Like, broke my leg on a 100 foot wave in like 17 places. Yeah, that's fine. Like, they'll just stitch it back together. I'll be out in two months. It's just insane, <laughs> dude. I'm not built like that. It's impressive. (laughs) You know, side note, and this is not to make a blanket recommendation because that would be really irresponsible, but I saw a presentation. I'm not sure if it's publicly available on a scientific study that examined psilocybin. So what is considered the active component Everybody knows what that is. <laughs> some do some do in psilocybe mushrooms or different types of mushrooms so magic mushrooms in parkinson's patients oh shit for the minimizing or reversal of symptoms and it's very compelling mm. so i do think that psychedelics it's unclear exactly what type to me at least maybe they are the tryptamine psychedelics Mm. maybe they are who knows maybe it has something to do with the serotonin type 2a receptors i'm not sure that's beyond my pay grade but i will say that for those who are interested if they can find this research which could be very preliminary who knows maybe it's kind of pilot study type of status, but looking at psilocybin as applied to Parkinson's patients, I do think it's from a neurogenesis perspective, I find it one of the more promising avenues of exploration. Right. I I, I do think for people with TBI, I do think psychedelic assisted therapies are very interesting. I would say psilocybin probably one of the better researched molecules and worth investigating. Ibogaine, also very interesting, but it has cardiac... Mm, like It stops your heart. There are cardiac implications. The Nolan Williams I mentioned earlier has looked at ways to mitigate some of the cardiac risk. Both of those are very, very, very interesting. Psilocybin at this point probably being the more versatile of the two, just from a safety profile perspective, but I'm very optimistic about, for those people who want to look at the edges of scientific inquiry, I'm very optimistic, actually, in a way that I wasn't, say, 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. in how we might contend with neuro sort of cognitive decline, right? Or Mm -hmm. neurodegenerative disease. I'm actually much more optimistic than I was 10 years ago. Did you happen to invest in Paul Stamets' new company? I did not. I, I'm not doing a whole lot of investing, and I have. We did it at True Ventures. And you he, did good. He's, he's got a Great. psilocybin new new company that they're doing studies, and hopefully, when this stuff gets legalized, we'll see what happens. Yeah, Paul Stamets knows his stuff, man. You know, Paul Stamets is uh, he's one of a kind. He's a he's a great human being. In my experience, all my experiences with him, we actually just last week, maybe in the last two weeks, he and I did a challenge grant to raise money for the Amazon conservation team to buy historically 
indigenous land to return it to certain tribes in Colombia, including the Kogi and a handful of others. They're not in the Amazon. They're at higher altitude in the north and a handful of others. And then ACT equips them with training to be able to sort of monitor and report on their territory because it's not really enough just to secure land rights. And uh, Paul was generous enough to, along with my foundation, to issue the challenge grant. So we just did that together in the last two weeks. Paul knows his stuff. He really, really knows his stuff. I, I feel very confident in saying that. Smart guy. He's got some great TED Talks as well. We're checking out. All right. Should we move on? <laughs> Let's move on. So I'll mention something that's sitting outside. I can, I can see it from here that people might be interested in. So I, I have been and still am a fervent believer in cold therapy. Mm. So using, using ice baths as a means of controlling it inflammation as a means of mood elevation. Oh, mood elevation, big time. Oh, it's unbelievable. And uh, generally, my approach has been to get a chest freezer of some type and fill it with ice, et cetera. Yeah. And that works, but they get really disgusting really quickly. And they all do, dude. I bought one of the machines, the real pro ones. Yeah, and then you're stuck with this thing that is an eyesore and you don't know what to do with it. it. I tried to sell it. I couldn't. Yeah. So I ended up because I I realized how much of a, uh, how significant a lever this is for improving my quality of life just on a daily basis. Like, and and I'll backstep for a second and just say one thing that I learned from Tony Robbins to give him credit. And I don't know if he came up with this, but is this sequence of state story strategy. So it's like fix your state first. Only then can you come up with an enabling story and only then can you come up with an effective strategy. Because if you're like feeling shitty and you're sleep deprived and you're kind of depressed or anxious or whatever, you try to come up with a strategy, meaning how to fix something, Mm -hmm. you're not going to come up with a good strategy, generally Mm -hmm. generally speaking. So it's like fix your, fix your physical state first. Then you can come up with an enabling story, then come up with an effective strategy. So the the state piece is very important. There aren't that many ways I have found to change state. Exercise is one, but it requires generally a fair amount of time. Heat is also effective, but again, generally requires, say, it doesn't sound like a much, but it's like 15 to 30 minutes, let's just say, in a sauna. Very effective. Cold is the fastest. It's just the fastest for me. And I've gone without cold therapy because I've not wanted to get some huge chest freezer or a a pro model. I am also going to be getting a pro model. They get all scummy though, and then you got to put chlorine in them, and it's just, it's a lot. Yeah, there's all that. But I went on Amazon and I found something called the cold pod, which you set up in like five minutes. You fill it with water from a hose, you put ice in. And it works perfectly well as a cold plunge. And I, I ended up buying a Yeti cooler to store ice in. So I have a few days of ice. And uh, it's, let's see, what would it be? It would be like, if you were standing, maybe it's hip height. And it's probably three feet in diameter. And you get in, you just kind of crouch in there. And it works fucking great. It works really well. And it costs like 150 or 200 bucks, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's 100 bucks. It's not crazy. 169. There you go. And I've been really impressed with this thing. It's very basic. And even when it's been very hot outside, like you put in two bags of ice and you let it sit for 20 minutes, it's going to get pretty cold. It's not going to be 30 degrees, but it's probably going to be mid 50s, depending on how much water you have in there. Pro tip, the more water you have in there, the more ice you're going to need to cool it. So don't fill it all the way up to the top. Yeah, fill it up like halfway and then add the ice. And it's been a game changer for me. It's a plastic trash can, dude. Well, no, it's not a plastic trash can. I mean, probably whoever is... made this shit because it probably cost them like 
15 bucks to build one of these things. It's yeah, it's not a trash can. I just to be clear, I mean it's look, it's we're not talking about a fucking Maserati, but here's what's nice about it. It's very easy to set up. It's not a trash can cuz that makes it sound like it's like mid chest height and hard. It's easy to pack. You can actually travel with it if you want to travel with it. So, I would just say for people who have How do you travel with it? Oh, it's super easy, man. Oh, it folds up? Yeah, it folds up. You stick it in a bag. You can take it with you. It's super easy. Put it in your hotel room. <laughs> yeah, the hotel loves 50 gallons of water spilling out. <laughs> so for those people who have perhaps heard about the benefits of cold therapy, but have avoided it because it's too expensive, it's too time consuming, whatever, this is a way to test it. And I would just say, this is a low hurdle way to test it out. And I used it earlier today. It was fantastic. Changed my day. So that's the cold pod. Yep. And there are a bunch of other options that look basically identical. I just went with the one with the best reviews. <laughs> Nothing fancy. That's amazing. I need something like this because I don't want to commit to like sterilizing my water. That's always been the problem with these yep. things, right? I just want something I can get into. But how many bags of ice do you really need to pull this off? I'd have to go look at the bags that are in the Yeti right now. I mean, you need... Like six? No. Well, it depends on the size of the bag, right? I would say, I'm guessing, I have no idea if this is accurate, two 20-pound bags of ice, probably. Okay. So something like that. Assuming that it is about half full. If you fill it up to the brim, you are making a mistake because now... To lower the temperature, you're going to need a higher volume, a larger volume of ice. But if we're talking about, let's just say it's halfway up, and then you put in two 20-pound bags of ice, you're set. So with a, with a Yeti cooler and this thing, I am good to go. I got a question for you, Kev Kev. Can you hear me? Yeah. Have you ever read poetry? This is hard left. Yes. Yeah? What do, what do you read? It's more, I shouldn't say it's, it's, it's poetry. I've done, well, <laughs> it's, it's tweets. <laughs> no. no, no, no. I'm going to send you the book that I found that I, I started reading recently that was fantastic, but I, I've dabbled. Horton, here's a who? No, no, no. I've had a, a couple books that I picked up, but they're mostly haiku books. Like for me, haiku is kind of my poetry. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's sort of in the zone, right? <laughs> it's in the zone. I like haiku no. because it, it's just like it really has no. to hit. <laughs> Don't fuck with me. <laughs> it really has to hit, though. You know what I mean? Like, you got three lines. Like, you get, you get yeah, a ball yeah. something pretty amazing. You know, speaking of that, that sci fi writer, it's like it, it really forces you to have something really dense and, 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 and trigger, make the mind leap, you know, in those three lines, yeah. as they say in haiku. So. It's a strong constraint. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering, because I've been delving strongly back into poetry, and that Ethan Hawke nine-minute TED Talk, uh, which is very informal, but don't let it fool you. He, he prepared for it. The giving yourself permission to be creative. He talks about poetry, and he mentions and I'm going to butcher this, but he says, you know, no one really cares about poetry or you wonder why would, why on earth people would read poetry until you have something happen. It could be something tragic, like the death of a parent. It could be something incredibly joyous, like the birth of a child. And you wonder, has anyone ever felt this way before? Mm -hmm. How am I going to get through this? Mm -hmm. Or how should I think about this? And then poetry becomes really relevant. Mm -hmm. or it can become really relevant. And I've been delving back into Mary Oliver. I read her collection Devotion, and I recently bought a small collection called DreamWork, which I haven't finished. So in disclosure, if you read it and you hate it, I'm not going to take the blame for it. I also have reread now multiple times this collection of newly translated Rumi called Gold by mm -hmm. Haleliza Ghaffori. Yeah, Rumi's great. Who is particularly interesting to me because she is a poet herself in English, but she's also a native Farsi speaker. So mm. she can go back to the source material, the original, and translate effectively. 
And what many people don't realize is that many versions of translated poetry are not actually directly translated. They take some earlier English translation from like the 1920s or something, and then they turn it into better poetry. But now you have a leap from, say, Farsi to English to English, which is like a game of telephone. Things get distorted. Mm -hmm. Whereas she can go directly. So Gold, this very short collection of Rumi poetry, I've reread a number of times. And this this particular poet, I, I have not read this yet, but you can see this. It says, Time is a Mother by Ocean mm -hmm. Vuong. V-U-O-N-G. Which I assume is Vietnamese. I read his first book, which blew my mind. I'm not sure why I was drawn to it. I bought it as an impulse purchase at some Barnes and Noble in New York City. And I think it was probably the title. The 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 title was Night Sky with Exit Wounds, which is a great fucking title. It's so good. Mm -hmm. And it had this like family That's a great fucking title. I love a good title. Isn't like it great? Yeah. And it was like a family photo on the front. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? So I picked it up and it's <laughs> I will warn people in advance. Trigger warning for some people. There are some very graphic sex scenes in this poetry book. So there's that. I have not read his new collection yet, but Night Sky with Exit Wounds, an apology to the author if I'm butchering your name. I was very impressed. And what I loved about it also is that I'm generally reading the words of dead poets. Mm, oh my God, dude. You yes. know what I mean? Like I'm, all, like I'm always reading the words of dead poets. And this is a contemporary. I would guess that this author is younger than I am. And it's still like put me into the cosmic philosophical washing machine and fucked me up. And I was like, okay, all right. And can nice. I give you a couple recommendations then if you're into this? Yes. There's a, there's a book called Japanese Death Poems. Fantastic. <laughs> I was gifted that by a friend of mine who used to be Marine Force Recon. And it's fucking amazing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So Japanese How did you find that book? There's haiku in there as well. Like it, it's like it, it was part of like my whole discovery of haiku. So that one is great. No, I know, also, but how did you discover that? I'm curious before you get to the next oh, one. I'll tell how you did how, you find it? I read a book called Three Simple Lines, which Henry Shookman, Zen master that you've had on the podcast, recommended to me. Yeah. And he's at this, Natalie Goldberg is the author. She was the author of this book called Down the Bones, I think it's called. Writing Down the Bones. Writing Down the Bones. That's right. Writing Down the yeah, Bones. Yeah, that is a great book. Great so she book. has a book called Three Simple Lines, which is about haiku, and huh. it's fantastic. It's okay. a really good book. That got me into haiku. That got me excited about a bunch of other of the greats, like Basho and, and Busan, like some of the best Japanese haiku writers the OGs. <laughs> OG crew. So I bought a, a book called The Sound of Water, and then that led me to the Japanese death poems. And then there was one other one that I wanted to tell you about that is really awesome, which is, oh, here it is. It's Chiyo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up the Japanese pronunciation. It's Chiyo Ni. Do, are, are you familiar okay. with C-H-I-Y-O, Chiyo Ni, N-I? Is that how you would say that? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Okay. What so, is that? So. She is a Japanese woman haiku master. And so huh. if you go and look up, like, basically, haiku masters back in the day, is probably would come to no surprise, were all men. Mm -hmm. And so she is one of the very few that, like, was taken in and, like, broke out and became a Japanese haiku master. And so it's just a, a really kind of awesome story. And you get, you know, some, some haiku from a, a female in, back in those days, which is, you know, a long time ago. So super rare, super yeah, rare, super rare. Super rare. Yeah, I am. I'm reading. Okay. So I think it's Fukuda Chioni. So it's her that's her name. Fukuda, Fukuda, which means, I guess, like 
fortuitous rice patty, <laughs> Fukuda. That's amazing. It's like thousand era. Ooh, my kanji are failing me right now. Ni I'm blanking on. Was a Japanese poet of the Edo period and a Buddhist nun. She's widely regarded as one of the greatest poets of haiku. And then hokku, I don't know what that is. Some of Shio's best works include The Morning Glory, Putting Up My Hair, and Again the Women. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've not had any exposure to her. Yeah, definitely worth picking up. I think it's out of print. Holy shit. She right began now. writing haiku at seven. And by age 17, had become very popular all over Japan. That's nuts. Yeah, I had read... Considering that, that she was born in 1703. So right. to be born in 1703 and by 17 as a woman in yes. Japan, yes. to be famous all over Japan, that's bananas. Right. And, and I had seen some of her work in these other books, and it was just mind-blowing. And I'm like, who is this woman? And then I did similar to what you did probably a year ago where I read the Wikipedia entry or whatever, and I was like, holy shit, she was a badass. All right, I'll check it out. So is the name of the book then Shioni? Is that it? Yeah, it's a Shioni Woman Haiku Master. That's that's one the one I purchased. There could be others about her, but that was the one that I had purchased, which which just is probably just a compilation of her her works. Cool. So other books. I'll throw out there for people interested. I recently listened to, I've been doing a lot of audiobooks recently, Coyote America. And I think the subtitle is A Natural and Supernatural History, which I believe is by Dan Flores. Yes. Coyote America, A Natural and Supernatural History. And it's got 4.6 on Amazon with more than 1500 reviews and it's a biological natural evolutionary history of the coyote but also a supernatural aka mythological history of coyote and, and the significance of coyote in, in different indigenous traditions and it goes through the entire span of history also drawing most interestingly i think parallels between the evolution and adaptation of homo sapiens and the evolution and adaptation of coyotes it's uncanny i'm not gonna lie to you this sounds horrible <laughs> sounds horrible okay sorry sorry you, you love coyotes wow yeah. so you love judgy wolves. you love wolves no wolves are your, your shit no coyotes would be first probably wolves would be second what's the one that licked you in the mouth those were wolves when i spent time with with Arctic wolves. I mean, gray wolves, but from Canada. That's crazy. They licked you right in the mouth. Yeah, on the teeth. That's the greeting. Yeah. It, it, by the way, folks who may wonder, wolf head, not the same as a dog head. They are fucking humongous. Mm -hmm. Like they can put their entire, they can put your entire head in their mouths. They're, they are <laughs> not the same as dogs. But I would say coyotes, I, I would identify more with, with coyote. And it's, it's a fascinating history to recognize how adaptive both humans in the sense of homo sapiens and uh, coyotes have been over time. I mean, humans attempted the most systematic extermination of coyotes as a species unlike any other species in the history of humankind. I mean, we're talking about millions upon millions upon millions of poison bait traps and so on set. And despite that, coyotes have proliferated and adapted beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. Now, part of that is from the removal of of their check and balance, which is gray wolves. So there's the, there's the removal of the gray wolf as the apex predator, mm. which then has resulted in part in this proliferation of coyote populations. But they are, because they were never the top predator, they have a wariness and caution about them yeah. that makes them very hard to kill. Furthermore, when they're under pressure, their litter size increases. Isn't that wild? As an as a like an evolutionary adaptation, when they're under threat, they go from having 
I'm making this up, but let's just say three pups per litter to like six or seven pups per litter. Oh, crazy. Isn't that wild? It is wild. It's a fascinating book. It's really, really interesting. And also uh, interesting from the lens of looking at how we have historically looked at coyotes as a reflection of the aspects of ourselves that we were least willing to accept. Mm. Super interesting. Going all the way back to Mark Twain, who I love Mark Twain. However, on the particular (laughs) account of coyotes, created a whole ton of fucking damage and craziness. But it was a good book. It was a good book, especially the first half, I would say. You know what I wish there was? This is just me being a a random two glass and a half in podcaster. It's the random show. It's the random show. (laughs) You know what would be fun is like, I'm just making this up. I like product ideas. Wouldn't it be cool if you could say, hey, I'm Tim. At 7 p.m. tonight, I'm going to listen to this Coyote book for an hour. And uh-huh. like we could all tune in and like listen and at the same time and like and yeah. like see comments and chat and stuff like that. And there would be no voice, like it wouldn't be a disruptive. We're just all listening. And like it would be like you could say like one thing per five minutes or whatever, and like or give a heart or something, like when you liked a certain segment of it or something. There'd be something pretty powerful about that. That would be super fun. I think people would really dig that. Especially if they knew that you were kind of listening at the same time. It's like, oh, I'm listening with Tim right now. I love that idea. All right, Audible. So anybody from Audible's out there. Yeah, being synchronous and connected in that way. Dude, tech, it's like... It's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, that's not <laughs> what I was going to say. I mean, it is amazing. Amazingly good and amazingly bad. I mean, we are, we are more connected than we have ever been in terms of communication and more isolated and lonely yes. than we have ever been. Uh, Holy shit. What a situation. Good point. All right, let's get through. We're an hour and a half in, but I've got some crazy shit to tell you still. Let's go to crazy town. Come on, Kevin Rose, you've been holding out. You and I have been supplement geeks for a while. You more so than me for many, many years. You got me onto some crazy shit early on. Always <laughs> give credit back to the Tim Ferriss for the earliest you got me into everything man all the hgh yeah. and stuff and you were yeah fecal to- matter transplants from tasmania <laughs> yeah all but the I, ketamine suppositories <laughs> just the best i mean i just did one before we started the show so I'm just, you know feeling it all right so a, a few things that I, is that a thing by the way do people put ketamine <laughs> on their butt Oh yeah, they boof they boof the K up the up, up the bung. It's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. yeah. I think it's kind of ridiculous, but people it's like fast. any excuse to take drugs up the bung. This is this is also like a constant through human history. Yeah, go go figure that one out. <laughs> do, you, do you have a book about it in coyotes? <laughs> <laughs> the four hour coyote suppository. Yeah. All right. I don't really want a, a coyote up the bung. That sounds uncomfortable. It does. Let, let's go straight into supplements. For everybody involved. A few of the things that I wanted to mention were some of, you know, you and I, you've cut back on supplements. Is that fair to say over the years? It used to, when I went to your medicine cabinet one time, there was like a thousand things in there. Yeah. I, I mean, less than I used to, for sure. I mean, okay. I still take more supplements than anyone else I know, except for maybe Peter. <laughs> you tell me how many of these you agree with or you take or you're curious about, Okay. Number one, I found that collagen right. for us getting older is is legit in terms of like reducing vis, 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 visible lines, like just general skin health. You're doing great. I know. <laughs> Come on. Fuck. <laughs> Do you take collagen? This is going to sound funny. Collagen makes me kind of itchy. I don't know why. That's it? It makes me like I, I get kind of itchy. Yeah. So I do take collagen. I think it's very interesting also as a flooding dose prior to resistance training. And people can look this up. Taking collagen prior to stimulating, say, a location of injury Mm. is very, very interesting. So I I do find it is interesting. Yeah. I used to have left knee. But I hate being really fucking itchy, so I don't don't take it too much. So two things. I I was – Ron DePatrick puts together some – a great data – kind of analysis of all the different published studies that are out there. And there's really strong evidence around 
just general skin elasticity as you get older. And then obviously joints in general, if you're running any of that type of stuff, just really healthy joint stuff. Great Lakes, no affiliation. Brand that Rada takes. I'm a fan of. Okay. I'm just going to bang. Yeah, your cheeks look like a newborn's buttocks. Is that from the collagen? They look very voluptuous. One other thing before we get off the collagen train, bone broth. Okay. Okay. So Brodo, which Mm -hmm. you know Marco, right? Yeah, I do. Of course I know Marco. Okay. So Marco... James Beard award-winning chef, best chef in New York City. Amazing. He's been on my podcast. Yeah. He's amazing. He's fantastic. He's fantastic. Here's the cool thing is I talked to him. Brodo Forever was his broth company where he shipped you frozen broth to your house. Mm-hmm. And I used it all through COVID. It was fantastic. It, it's like the best broth kills everything on the shelves that I've been a part of that I've tasted. He figured out a way to get it. So the, he doesn't have to add any preservatives, no concentrates or nothing, but he, shelf stable. So mm. it's fantastic. And it is, these are single servings. You rip them up and put them in a cup and there's like one minute in the microwave and you're good to go. It's my go-to broth. Brodo is fantastic. Brodo.com, no affiliation, not invested. Just a friend. All right. You ready for two more things? <laughs> Quentin and Hill. So I also mention, and this is this is a little self interested because I'm one of the largest investors in this company. But so he has also played around with bone broth from Axis Deer from Maui, which is from Maui Nui Venison, which oh, I'm has. very involved with. And the collagen and protein levels are fucking bananas. They're like off the charts to the point where people think there are errors in the lab reports it's wow. really really wild yeah would they do pills of that because that would be really interesting in, in pill form i don't think so right now it's it's just whole food or nothing which i kind of like because it forces you to do a little bit of work but marco is the master of broth he really mob is. he really is yeah a try out brodo 100 if, if you live in new york by the way, he's got physical locations where you can go and get these bras, like in cup form, like at, like if you're going to a cafe. And uh, you'll know, anyone in New York will tell you, like, it's the best. It's just legit. All right. Yeah. A couple more things. Three more things real quick. Aesop, you know the brand, Aesop? Yeah. What is that? They make little tiny baby hand sanitizers now. And they smell amazing. A E S O P. Yeah. Okay. Do you, so, you not know this what, brand? <laughs> no, I do know the brand. What, what are you using your hand sanitizer for? No, just like, you know, when you're in Ubers and shit. You know, you just got a little hand sanitizer. You got kids, you know. Okay, so I just want to throw that out there. I have no affiliation. Next thing is creatine fucks up my stomach. It really does. Yeah. Potential for disaster pants high. All kinds of things are wrong with creatine. <laughs> but as someone that works out, you want to take it because you you know you get a little boost in the gym and all that good stuff. Have you ever tried this stuff right here? Crealkaline, yeah. It's, I've got some in the bathroom. It, do you really? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. It's buffered creatine. It, it, dude, it, yeah. it eliminated all my stomach issues. Yeah. So it's done by now sports. If you've had issues with taking creatine and you're working out and you want to take some, I just want to throw it up there as something that is, is good. You want to hear a horrifying story that oh, I would please. never tell you if I were sober? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in San Francisco and I was rushing to prepare for an international flight, long international flight. I can't remember where I was going, but it was a long flight. Like 12 plus hours kind of deal. Yeah, that kind of deal. And I was running around, running around, and I had... Two double espressos. I had some espresso machine. I had like two double espressos, <laughs> a bunch of magnesium, oh, and a I whole shit ton of creatine. <laughs> like four grams, five grams? What did you do? Uh, some stupid amount, like yeah. unnecessary amount. And I thought that was a good idea for whatever reason. And so I'm driving to the airport and I'm like, oh, God, my stomach doesn't feel so good. And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of gassy. Oh, not feeling so great. And so, you know, I do a little lean and just promptly shit all over myself. Oh my God. <laughs> so bad. And Are I'm you like, in an Uber? Right. 
no, no, I'm driving myself to like long term parking. And I'm like, okay. And I, <laughs> so I'm like, wow, this is a disaster. <laughs> what do I do here? You bust out the <laughs> luggage. <laughs> yeah. No, this is when I wish I had your ASOP hand sanitizer. And so I'm on my way and I'm just like, all right, how do I find the silver lining in this? Because this is so bad and I'm going to be late to my flight. I might miss my flight. And I call one of my close friends. I'm not going to mention my name because I'm like, this is the one guy who's going to find this funnier than anyone else. So I call him and I'm like, you will not believe what just happened. And I explained the whole thing. And of course, he gets like extreme delight out of this whole situation, which like gives me some redeeming aspect to the whole thing. I get to the long-term parking garage and I'm like, what do I do here? So I like, take off my underwear, wipe myself down with my underwear, chuck it under some other car and run to my flight and <laughs> with no underwear on with like long pants obviously <laughs> and then sit down for like a 12 hour flight smelling like i've just oh taken a tumble through God. a fucking slaughterhouse were you economy at that what stage of your career was this? oh yeah this was like middle seat economy for 12 hours oh, kind of thing fuck it was so bad i mean it was bad for me it was embarrassing but it was like bad also for everyone around me yeah and i'm not proud of this but i've had enough domain tampier to confess my sins everyone's had a close call if not a fatal disaster in this domain yeah if you've had enough creatine and caffeine don't lie to me you've had disaster pants at some point either you saved it and you slid into home or you had absolute like triage where it was a disaster. Tim, you mentioned ASOP for you wish you had some during this occasion. Maybe they'll want to be a sponsor. You could probably cut this <laughs> little story out <laughs> just to, and use it and be like, you know, I shit myself one time and if I only had ASAP <laughs> hand sanitizer, <laughs> the whole plane would have been You happy. know, I think that'll be one of their highest converting Exactly. That's all time. I have something to show you as a as a as an artifact, physical artifact. So, this is the latest cock punch coffee. I'm oh. sure you can see it. it's very pretty. Wow. It's very like reflective and gorgeous. That is beautiful. That's a, a lot of cock punch. How big is that bag? This bag is how many ounces is this? Let's see. This is ten ounces. So we got. We got the we got the cock punch sort of Miami Vice magenta and teal type colors in the front. We got all the greater houses on the side. We got the eightfold arena icon on so that cool. opposite side, which is also for the clerics, House Nemos. And then we got the sort of description on the back, QR code to like the whole story. And then we have the UPC, which means that this is retail ready. So I will have some announcements in the not too distant future. Oh, fuck. I got to go buy some more of your NFTs. Ah, uh, yeah. This, this coffee, holy shit. I've never been a meth addict, and I don't want to trivialize it, but <laughs> <laughs> when I was testing for this, I didn't understand how real coffee masters and and baristas test coffee. So I was doing multiple cups of coffee for every variation that I tested. Oh, yeah. And I was drinking like 12 cups of coffee a day. I was so cracked out. It was not ideal, but I did test dozens and dozens of varieties and ultimately ended up on... Ethiopian? What mix is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. This is Bombay, Sadama, Ethiopia. Yeah. This is Ethiopia, Mother Station Wash. Ethiopian coffees are just like so chill. Yeah. They're like, nobody's offended. Everyone just loves them. They're just right down the fairway. They're yeah. not too heavy, not too light. They just give you a good flavor profile. Like, nobody's pissed. Not too oily. This is also medium blend. And yeah. it's, I want to give credit roast. where credit is due. This is roasted on a bellwether. So bellwether is all electric, the lowest carbon imprint coffee that you can purchase. It's all electric, which also makes it very replicable, which is super interesting, right? Because when you're using analog roasting technology, there's a pretty high degree of variance. Whereas with Bellwether, and Bellwether is B-E-L-L-W-E-T-H-E-R, 
it is all electric. So you can dial in the specs and really replicate on demand, which is impressive to me. I've been very yeah. impressed with their consistency. So I got to say on, the, on the, the, the whole thing, the conversation we had earlier about the cock punch name, if you go the route of stimulant drinks slash male... It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> enhancement. You're fucking set. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's right down the fairway. Yeah. yeah. The, the cock punch pills at the 7-Eleven <laughs> behind the counter that just like, get you going. Like, yeah, right at the impulse purchase yeah. <laughs> realm, right next to five-hour like, energy. Do you need a lift? Cock punch. It's like... Cock punch, yeah. yeah. So, And also, all of my proceeds are going to the foundation. So they go directly to early stage science and all that Dude, stuff. Dude, that new jet that you guys bought for your foundation... Beautiful. <laughs> you're such a you're such a prick. You G6? Like, I do not beautiful. have a jet for the foundation. Kevin is <laughs> punching me in the nuts. As per usual. Hashtag okay. cock punch. All right. What else you got? I got two more things to say. All right. This one here, I'm about three months into testing. It's called One Skin. And I am not a, a person that goes out and buys like skin products. But I have said, as I've gotten older, like, you know, you think about your crow's feet and all the other shit you have going on, like uh, eyebrows and all this stuff. Uh, eyebrows are fine, but I don't know why. Like right, right, right here, this part right here. <laughs> no wine involved in this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but what, what got me interested is this is a very science-driven team that isolated a, a peptide that is clears out senescent cells. And I okay. at, at, basically like euthanizes all the people in the senior living home, basically from a cell much. perspective. It just like makes all the bad cells die and all the fresh ones live and lines go away. I, I think this is all bullshit, but here's the thing. Rhonda <laughs> Patrick was the first one to talk about it because she was like convinced by the science. And then David Sinclair also tweeted about it because he was really convinced by the science. And I'm like, listen, these are two people that are way above my pay grade that on the science side, I respect. And if they're talking about this peptide and they're liking the, the kind of peer-reviewed articles that are coming out about it, or science is coming out about it, I'm going to pay attention. And so I, oh, you know, it was one of the person I tweeted about too. But anyway, I pick some up and like, you know, I'm like three months in and I'm starting to notice little tiny changes, just like in skin yeah. quality and like huh. less like bumpiness that I would have and more just kind of like supple. I've also had some pizza, a lot of pizza lately, so I probably have fatter cheeks than normal, but you look very, very supple. Yeah. Pleasantly <laughs> plump. But I would say that in general, I'm pretty impressed. So I just want to throw that out there. I'm not the, the scientist, but you know, a couple amazing scientists have already recommended this. It's called one skin, one skin. Yeah. O -N -E. I'm not an investor. One skin. Yeah. Just O N E skin. Right. And they, they don't have like this extensive product line of all these things. There's like, three things you can buy, like a cleanser and an eye cream and a lotion. I like that. Yeah. I, it's not I, like honestly more and more. Things. I like a few skews, you know, it's like if you have right. a thousand things, I'm like, all right, you're like lining your pipeline with all this shit to feed me. Exactly. As a customer. But it's like, if you, if you have like one, two, three things, all right, you're really focused on yeah, refining gotta, that product. I have a buddy that had lost a bunch of weight lately and had a bunch of kind of like lines in his neck. And so he started applying a bunch of the stuff to his neck and he's like, I'm noticing some results. And I was like, Hmm. It's kind of interesting. It's worth it's worth like letting other people try it and see what they think, you know. My crow's feet are like fucking brontosaurus feet at this point. They're so fucking significant. They're, they're Dude, out you of should control. Try it on one eye for for three months and just <laughs> that would be fucking cool, right? Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. That's actually a really, that's a great idea. Try it on one eye <laughs> on your days. End up like, like a real yeah, fucked up, end up like a crow's eye. feet pirate. That'd be great. <laughs> just just one eye. Your date's like oh something's going on. What, right. what was it called? No, no, no. Okay. One, One skin. skin. Yeah. Anyway. All right. All right. Lastly, this is a Peter Atia recommendation. I wanted a really clean, 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 clean protein for when I make shakes and work out. You, you probably know about ProMix, right? I don't know anything about them. Oh, so this is Atia's favorite protein, or at least it was as of a couple months ago. Is he an investor in ProMix? I don't think so. No. It's called ProMix. The founders, I was reading who's behind it, and it, it's like just insanely, insanely clean. Like, grass-fed, you know, hormone-free cows, minimally processed. You know, there's a lot of them that are out there like this, but I know Atia has a whole like SWAT team of people that do all the due diligence for him when he's considering anything new. And if he's going to mm -hmm. say something interesting, 
I pay attention. And they actually make these little tiny bars that are whey protein, like little rice crispy treats kind of thing, but they're they're not they don't spike your glucose because I wear my continuous glucose monitor. And it puts on, I think it's like they're either 15 or 20 grams of protein. And so I, I just have those as snacks mm. that I travel with as well. So Promix is his favorite protein as of the last time I chatted with him. So Promix. And then uh, do you want to mention this rice cooker? I think that might be interesting. Yeah. So I found a rice cooker. I don't have a link to it in front of me, but there was a rice cooker that I stumbled upon. So I love rice. Me too. Rice is fucking delicious. It's so, so good. good. And Tim, like back in the day, and you'll remember this quite well, but when we when you were into a continuous glucose monitors, and then you got me into them shortly after, you used to have to like manually inject yourself with that big ass syringe. Do you remember to put those in? Oh, so bad. It was Do you so remember bad. how it was bad? Like a, it was like a barbecue fork tongue that you had to stick yeah. in your abdomen. It was really yeah. bad. And you would watch the needle go in. There was like no quick mm. action. You had like push it in and push no. it out. And then you would get this continuous glucose monitor. And this is like, you know, whatever, 10 years ago. And you started doing it. I thought you were crazy. And then I I, like copied you like two months later and started doing it. Later, three months later, (laughs) started doing it. And one of the things I noticed, and I've noticed since my entire time doing CGMs, is that rice is my biggest offender. If I Mm -hmm. eat a cup of rice, my shit is through the roof on the glucose side. And everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Everybody has different microbiome. There's a whole slew of factors on what happens here. But here's the interesting thing. Toshiba who is a trusted brand, came out with a quote-unquote low-carb rice cooker. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, low-carb, like, this bullshit, right? We all know rice is high-carb. Oh, what are they talking about? Brown rice? You know, like, all this shit, right? Even brown rice spikes me, by the way. So I, I went, I did the research, and what they've done is they created this clever little basket. They figured out that a typical rice cooker, 99.9% of rice cookers, you pour the water in, cook the rice, it stews in its own water, and your rice is done. You scoop it in your bowl. A bunch of the starch, call it like 70 or so percent of it, is released in that water during the the kind of the process of actually making and cooking the rice. So Toshiba invented a new rice cooker. They call it their Fuzzy Logic technology rice cooker that has a basket that lets all of the starchy water drain to the bottom, and you end up with a much lower glycemic load. It cuts the carbs by 37%. And dude, I ate a cup of rice and I'm telling you, I can see it on my CGM. It does not spike me nearly as much as the full rice, which I thought was pretty awesome. And I wouldn't have believed this in anyone else, but Toshiba came out with it. And I was like, okay, if Toshiba's going to put their name behind it, like they must have done the research, you know? Yeah, they're a big dog. It's $179. It's like, if you're, if you want to just cut a little bit of carbs out of you or rice is a big offender for you, this works with like, you know, they, it works with oatmeal, it works with the whole slew, what brown rice, white rice, and quinoa, the whole range of things. But anyway, I just thought it was really cool. It's got 1,852 ratings with four and a half out of five stars, 4.6 stars out of five. So people love it. 300 plus have bought it in the last month. Let me ask you this. Taste-wise, yeah. is it as I good? Is it? It's okay. A little bit on the texture, a little tiny bit on the texture, but like, I'd say like, call it a maybe five to seven percent delta from what you're normally experiencing on rice so it's you're not pissed it's fine yeah yeah. nobody's complaining that's a big deal it's a big deal i fucking love rice there are so many carbs that i can i'm like whatever i can do without it i love rice oh my god do i love rice when you go hog like full hog on something like cheat (laughs) cheat night what do you do i'll tell you what i did two nights ago i went with daria and we had a couple martinis I, I pulled out, I pulled out of the fridge. I had this like mixed berry, like it was like a berry cookie ice cream or some shit. And like, do you feel like hell when you crush an entire pint of ice cream? Like, I feel like I've just like have sinned beyond belief. Yeah. It's been a while since I've crushed a whole pint of ice cream. It's the worst. My weaknesses are super clear. My weaknesses are cheesecake. Mm. So my question for any wait staff is, from one to ten, no seven allowed. How good is your cheesecake? And if they give me an eight, nine, or a ten, I'll do the cheesecake. Mm. There's cheesecake, and then there's carrot cake. Carrot cake's good too. Oh my god! But it has to be super moist, and the icing has to be really, really, really good. I also can't have big chunks of carrot in it. 
If it has big chunks of carrot, I'm like, I'm fucking eating carrots. No, I don't want, like, carrot cake is a joke. It's fucking cake, right? I mean, right. no, if it's got huge chunks of carrot, like, I'm not Bugs Bunny. I don't need. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't some have a carrot Some people do that, though. I've had some fucking carrots in there, and I'm just like, why is there chunks of carrot? I'm not into it. No. Yeah, same. So those two, I will always go for. Pint of ice cream, and look, if it's in front of me, I'm sure I'll eat it. If I've had especially two drinks, <laughs> like two glasses or more of any drink. Like tonight. <laughs> like tonight. So martinis. You mentioned martinis. I love a good martini. Is it an old fucker thing that they end up turning to martinis? Because I have become more and more interested in martinis. Oh, my God, dude. So here's the deal, dude. Martinis, the thing that is so beautiful about them is that if you order it correctly, it is spirit clean. So it's not like a heavy, like there's no sugar. So here's what I do. I say, give me a gin martini. I, I typically go with, I like the less botanical gins. So I'll do yeah, a boodles me too. or something that, that is just like less botanical. And then I'll, I'll add in two olives and I'll say extra dry, extra cold. And then you're good to go. And just a, a tiny bit of vermouth. So on the dry side, rinse the glass with vermouth. And then so it's mainly gin. And you got those couple olives in there and you're good to go. Mm. What is your opinion on espresso martinis? I mean, I only do those at like my friend's bachelor parties or whatever. When you're like, <laughs> I'm going to be out till 2 a.m. Because like, otherwise caffeine fucks me like late at night. Yeah. Manhattan speedball. Yeah. I love espresso martinis. I got to be honest. Dude, they're really good. If you're on a date, go to town, son. Like, that's a yeah, great yeah, yeah. way to go out and have fun. I'm back on the field. I'm an old, I, you know, I'm not the young man I once was. My chi has been diminished. I need to compensate with caffeine. Tim, you got to move out here, dude. Like, this is like fertile ground. I don't know if I can deal with it. I don't know if I can deal with it, honestly. Why? It's too intoxicating. It's like, how much time do you want to spend falling down the rabbit hole with Alice in Wonderland? I mean, it's, it's intoxicating. Do you think they're all kind of... Can we bleep something out if I say it? Yeah, of course. Do you think they're all <laughs> out here? Or do you think it's like... Do you think, <laughs> let's bleep, bleep that part out. Are they all that type of person? Or do you think it's like... Because I think there's no. some like, good people. No, no, no. Not no, that no, she's no. a bad they're, person, but... <laughs> this, this edit's gonna be amazing i think there are amazing people it's just you have to really wade through and sort through a lot in la to get to the signal it's very hard what are you looking for in a relationship long term what are your like top go-to's like what, what, what do you want what do i want i want someone with don't say physical but I mean, the physical matters. Let's not fucking lie. Don't get me about wrong. It. I know what you want on the physical. Look, well, maybe Daria. Maybe I'll give Daria a compliment. Like, Daria takes very good care of herself. Oh, dude, she works out two hours a day. Yeah, I know. It's like that's not trivial, right? Like she, she's very, and it's for her as much as it is for you. But it's yeah. it's not for me. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a significant thing, right? Like the physical practice yeah. is a, is a significant thing. So. There's that. I mean, I like I like strong, physically attuned women, right? Yeah. Now, strong doesn't mean big. I'm not looking for a CrossFit <laughs> Games winner necessarily, but like someone who is very physically attuned is important yes. to me. That's important yes. to me personally. It's and it's important to a partner. Outside of that, I mean, I think that I'm looking for someone who is has a clear sense of identity and direction because mm -hmm. that direction may change. But if someone doesn't have a, a clear demonstrated ability to focus for at least a few years, I find right. that the relationship becomes this nitpicky project. Right. Well, you don't want them also just like hanging on, right? Like it's it got to be their own show too, right? They got not show, but you know what I mean? They got to have their own shit going on. They have to have their own shit going on. How should we wrap things up? I got way more things to talk about, but I know we've been going for a while. Do one more each? Yeah, sure. I'll give one. So mine is an app. You can find it on browser, on laptop as well, called Aralo, A-I-R-A-L-O, which is for cellular data overseas. And it is the easiest most reliable approach that I've found to cellular data overseas. So if you're going to any country, 
you can buy a cellular data plan, even if, for instance, in my case, Verizon may not support. Oh, I can or... help you here. I got a better solution than this, but go ahead. All right. Well, I can't wait to hear. Okay. The, you know, in, in case of Verizon, like, yeah, they want to upgrade you, in quotation marks, all the time to like an unlimited data plan. But the cost question is open for me. So I've used Aerolo, which I have been very happy with up to this point in time. So what's your better alternative? So here's something that people, most people don't know is that iPhones in particular, and I believe Android phones as well, they can support multiple SIMs. And at this, at this point in time, it's, they're called eSIMs because you don't actually need a SIM card. Yeah. So Aerolo is an eSIM. Yeah. Okay. So Google Fi is just insane because internationally, they give you coverage in just so many countries. I don't have the exact number, but I put on a secondary plan. So th there's two things that this helps you with. My main plan is Verizon, and I use that for data because they have good 5G. I use it for my main phone number. No, sorry. I don't use my phone number. I use it for data. I use my phone number at Google Fi because it's protected by two-factor authentication and all crazy security of Google Fi. So SIM swaps are, are a very, you know, they just can't happen because there's not, not a person to call to trick into doing a SIM swap. You have to actually log in with your Google account. So use that at Google Fi as your main number. Change the data to go to Verizon so you get the good data package because you can do this. So walk me through this just to back up. So I have a Verizon account. Okay. What do I do? Okay, so you want to transfer your number to Google Fi. How do you do that? You call Google Fi on the, on the website. We'll walk you through it. Now, Google Fi okay. is not going, to, not going to give you the best data. So what you then do is you say, okay, Verizon, I love you, but you're going to be my data-only plan. And they charge like $20 a month or something for it. It's data-only, okay? So that's your eSIM that is data-only. And then in the settings, you say, hey, where do you want to get your data from? And you say, I want to get it from Verizon. And then you got the 5G network, you're in the United States, you're good to go, right? And then your security of your main phone number is locked down by Google Fi. So that's the most secure place that you can have it. Then when you go abroad, because Google Fi has all of these international connections, it's like over 200 destinations, they say, they have coverage on. It's insanely cheap. Like Their data plans are the cheapest there are out there. Then you go into your phone settings and say, switch my data from Verizon to Google Fi. So now you're Google Fi all the time when you're international in one phone. You don't have to switch phones or anything. Mm -hmm. And so I have this like little two bar thing that goes on. They show you two bars on your phone when you when you do both of the plans. So it's it's great. Mm. I love it. Boom. So what is the infrastructure of Google Fi? How are they providing that data? They use multiple providers, but it's mainly T-Mobile in the United States. But it says that all plans inc include US, Canada, and Mexico, unlimited plans and flexible plans, data in 200 plus international destinations, plus 5G in select countries. And their 5G country list just keeps growing and growing. It's, it's great, man. Every time I've ever flied anywhere international, I just turn on Google Fi and I get like the highest speed. It's fantastic. And it's so inexpensive. Amazing. I'm on it. All right. So I'm taking notes too, folks. All right, Kevin, you said you had one more. Do you have something else? I've got a bunch of investing related stuff, but you can get that on my podcast, kevinrose.com. There'll be a link to the podcast at the top. <laughs> but I would say the last thing, which is the absolute no brainer right now, screw buying individual bonds. Like the rates are changing all the time. Vanguard, and this is not investment advice. This is just like me saying what I do personally. When I do my bonds, rather than do bond funds or, or, or crazy like medium term or long term bonds, we don't want to screw with that given where rates are at. VUSXX is the Vanguard fund that I use. And I think it's a no brainer in that it's 100% treasury based. So they buy US government treasuries. It's short term bond fund. So all these banks right now are being like, Hey, we'll give you four and a half percent. We'll give you 4%, blah, blah. Screw that. Even though it may seem like a quote unquote high interest yield, you go set up a Vanguard account, buy this fund right now. And, and this obviously changes day by day, not investment advice. Again, right now it's 5.32% compound yield on Vanguard with like the smallest management fee. And they're just buying us treasuries you're getting 5.3%. So that, that's what I'm doing on the bond side right now. Everything else, index yeah, yeah. invested, set it, forget it, except for NVIDIA. I also think that 
there's some upside in, in AMD potentially on, on the low end AI side. Wait, what? Hold on, say that again. Nvidia. Nvidia yeah, I think GPUs. It's going to three trillion. I think it's going to three trillion. The new plutonium. It's like the new arms race. Listen, AI is the shit. It's not going away anytime soon. It's not a fad. This is not VR, AR bullshit. This is really going to change the entire world. NVIDIA is the dominant player in this, this space. The stock, if you look at it, it's, it's like scary as shit because the run-up has just been like, you know, the most insane steep climb you've ever seen. I think long-term it's going to a $3 trillion company. You know, it's at close to two, hovering at two right now. This is a growth play. This is not, you know, an angel investment. I just, I, I hold some just because I like to hold a few individual stocks. I think AMD is a good cheap play for this. They still have a, a pretty high price to earnings ratio, but, and they also, I, I met with a good friend of mine that's an insanely, insanely smart PhD from MIT that is one of the earliest inventors of a bunch of AI, sold his company to Apple. I won't name him, but he told me that the problem with AMD is they have an underdeveloped software stack for AI, but they're rapidly trying to fix that because I think that's the biggest like issue that AMD has right now. AMD is like way cheaper than NVIDIA right now. So I, if, I, if I was going to like say, okay, I've got X number of dollars for an AI play, two things, dollar cost average your way in. So you're not buying the high and not buying the low. You're just spending a fixed amount of money over six months or so to like slowly work your way into the market. If you don't know what dollar cost averaging is, Google search it. And then AMD would be like, if I put like 75% in, in NVIDIA, I put 25% in AMD, not investment advice. TSMC is the manufacturer of all of the chips. TSMC makes NVIDIA chips, AMD chips. They are the backbone of this entire world when it comes to manufacturing CPUs, GPUs. The biggest concern there is they're in Taiwan. Hotly contested China issues. I don't touch it because I worry about China. <laughs> I talked to my buddy, again, my buddy that's really, really deep on the AI side, one of my most trusted advisors on the AI side. He said that, and this was a big shocker to me, he told me that Facebook invested in AI a few years ago and bought up, up some of the best engineers in AI. So he would not be surprised if Facebook unveils some crazy, shocking, amazing AI tech in the next six months to a year. And so I trust him. I'm not buying Facebook stock because I think they've, they're fucked up for a whole bunch of other reasons. They're spending way too much on VR and AR. But... That was eye-opening to me. The other two big players is Google and Amazon. Google's only showing a little bit of their cards right now, not revealing the whole thing. Bard, their AI, is insanely, insanely locked down. The real Bard behind the scenes, if you're at Google, it's way it's a 10x improvement over what they have publicly available. It's a lot better. I can just... I'll give a yeah. wink. It's a lot yeah. better. <laughs> Last thing, NT Doi, Nintendo. Super Mario Brothers, second highest box office sales out of all animated films. Hmm. Amazing movie. They're sitting on a fuck ton of IP. So a nibble for me is Nintendo. I nibble because I see them playing with Universal Studios. Could they be the next Disney? I don't know, man. Zelda could be the next Lord of the Rings. There's, yeah. there's a lot of IP locked up there in Nintendo. I think that, that could be oh, interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. That's fun. Whoever are wondering also Nintendo... Way back in the day, Nintendo. Nintendo. I knew you were going to do that. You always do that shit. Playing cards. Initially, they made trading cards. Hanafuda. Hanafuda trading cards. In Japan. And they were so they still make them. Yeah, oh, I see. They're just beautiful and delicious. Delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Utsukushi. Yeah. <laughs> Utsukushi. Very beautiful. <laughs> All right, man. Well, fucking A. We've covered a lot. That was great. So, nice to see you, buddy. Yeah, good to see you, brother. This was fun. Anything else you'd like to say, Kevin? You're going to point people to the new podcast, the Resurrected Podcast. Yeah, I mean, just if you if you head to kevinrose.com, it'll be at the header there. I'll make sure it's up. And I appreciate you all for listening. I promise some wild, crazy moments and some fun stuff. So thank you for tuning in. Kevin is very, 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 very good at his format. So check it out. And for the show notes from this, God knows what kind of mess my team will have to untangle. <laughs> But team.blog slash podcast, you'll find links to all sorts of shit. And Aesop, I'm sure. hand sanitizer for when you shit yourself. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> Hashtag Aesop Disaster Pants. <laughs> Sponsorship incoming. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you soon. Bye.